Um, uh, thank you everyone for coming out today. It's wonderful to see you all here for the 15th annual uh, conference for the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy. Uh, this organization has been about dialogue between all parties and political processes from the beginning. Uh, it's played an important role in the Tunisian uh, uh, constitutional development and the Tunisian democracy uh, from, the, from the beginning of the revolution and before. Uh, and uh, today we are going to talk about Islam and democracy, the bread and butter of this organization, but in the context of the crises in Syria, uh, the situation politically in Egypt, the crisis in Libya, the uh, fragile success in Tunisia, and the implications for U.S. policy. The goal of this conference is by the end of the day to have amassed uh, new recommendations for U.S. policy. So we'll be actively soliciting from panelists uh, in the plenary sessions and the, and the, and the panels uh, ideas for new recommendations for the U.S. government, and we will produce a document shortly after the conference with suggestions for uh, U.S. policy. Uh, democracy is fragile, and as Plato said, dictatorship naturally arises from democracy, and the most aggravated forms of tyranny and slavery out of the most extreme liberty. Plato warned us that democracy needed nurturing. Uh, when I look at, uh, I was looking at uh, Plato, uh, Plato's notions of democracy and other forms of government last night, and I saw something about timocracy, and thought about the US system right now looking a lot like timocracy, look it up on Wikipedia. Um, Huntington wrote that book in the 90s, uh, uh, Clash of Civilizations, which thousands of PhD dissertations have been written against. Uh, but um, he wrote a previous book, The Third Wave, which has uh, become, come back, back in vogue uh, since the Arab Spring. And a previous book before that, which I think is even more relevant to the uh, conference today, Political Order in Changing Societies, came out in 1968. And in the book, Huntington, at his best, I would argue, um, uh, talked about tipping points and talked about the social change that produces democracy and how Shortly after revolutions, countries can tip towards democracy or tip away from democracy. And the main factor, he argued, when societies tip away from democracy after revolutions is the lack of institutional uh, progress and institutional development. And I think this is a very important idea for us today because we have uh, 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 democratically enthused populations, as Plato said, and we have uh, a so rapid social change provoking revolutions, and yet the institutions in all the countries we're looking at today aren't ready for these changes. And, and, and there's going to be a, a need for international inputs to help with these changes. And these, there's no, I hear all the time, for example, from Egyptians, well, we've tasted freedom, we can't go back. That's not true. If you read and believe Huntington, you can go back and worse. So, uh, 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 the heart of all this for Plato and for others was education. I've often heard in the Arab world, Arabs don't need democracy because they're not educated. We need more education uh, uh, before we have democracy. And every time I hear that, I think of my great, 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 great grandfather who fought in the American Revolution up in Massachusetts. And he was an illiterate farmer from Groton, Massachusetts and didn't have a lot of education. And I often think if my great, 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 great grandfather was ready for democracy uh, way back then, aren't these very, very educated populations in the new region uh, ready for education, uh, ready for democracy now? Our first speaker today, oh, first of all, we have a great lineup today. I, I, I can't remember a lineup, like I said, at, at, at a one-day DC conference. Uh, 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 we have an incredible lineup today. Uh, and starting first and foremost with our first speaker, who I haven't seen speak publicly that often right now, and he's even offered to take questions. Uh, so this is a very special uh, moment for all of us. Philip Gordon uh, is an American diplomat, foreign policy expert, uh, former assistant secretary of state for European and Eurasian affairs. Uh, there's more of his bio in your program, um, but let me just say that he uh, 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 has a long career uh, both as a think tanker and as a doer 
here in Washington. He was hired, I think, for this position in particular because of his ability to get things done. And uh, um, I really look forward to hearing his remarks. Uh, Bill, thanks very much for uh, the introduction, but obviously just for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, this conference, which is, I think, particularly well-timed, and dare I say, even particularly well-named in the struggle for democracy in turbulent times, uh, that is a fair statement for sure. So let me thank you and Mr. Uh, Mansour for all the work you did in putting this together and for giving me the opportunity to address some of these issues uh, in these turbulent times, it's important to have an organization like yours that focuses on democracy uh, in the Islamic world, uh, and in particular in North Africa, which I think in Washington sometimes gets overlooked. So I am delighted to be here, delighted to welcome a number of guests from abroad, some of them I met on the way in, and the Tunisian delegation and others. Uh, three and a half years ago, I don't think anyone could have anticipated the degree of change which, uh, that would result from a singular act of defiance, in fact, in the death in Tunisia. Uh, it's true that scholars and officials had long anticipated that change would come at some point. No one predicted exactly when and where, under what circumstances. And in fact, by the early 21st century, uh, we had gotten so accustomed to the longevity of the region's repressive uh, autocratic regimes. Uh, you know, for 29 of the 30 years, between 1981 and 2011, if you had predicted that Mubarak or Gaddafi would still be in power the next year, uh, you would have been right. And so by then, we started to take that for granted. But we also knew deep down that such regimes could not last over the long run because they don't provide their citizens with the economic, social, and political opportunities uh, they need to create the lives that they want. Uh, and so in the long run, we knew that just as with other regimes in other places throughout history, uh, these would eventually pass because the citizens would demand change. By 2011, with the world so globally connected uh, and technologically advanced and networked so that people could get information from other countries and see what was happening in those other countries, finally the time came when those oppressive dictators could no longer so easily deny their people uh, their rights. Uh, we also knew then, or at least we should have known, that this kind of political change is incredibly difficult, and successful transitions uh, are hardly guaranteed. Uh, we know that a country like Libya, which had no history of uh, state institutions and deep internal divisions, and suffered for four decades at the whims of a dictator, uh, couldn't, from one night to the next, turn into a functioning democracy. We knew that. We knew that elections, even when relatively free and fair, uh, aren't enough to guarantee stability, certainly long-term stability. So there are deep divisions throughout the Middle East, and right now we see powerful forces trying to either uh, maintain an old order or to dominate the new ones that are uh, emerging. So we know that transitions to democracy, just like our own, are not smooth and linear. They face setbacks, challenges, and revised expectations. I can remind you uh, that after the European revolutions of 1848, it was several generations before we saw uh, democracy really take root, and even then, uh, it was faced with periodic setbacks. So it's probably fair to say that there was, in some quarters at least, some irrational exuberance in 2011 about the transitions that we were seeing, and maybe some just assumed too easily uh, in those heady days that we would see a quick and successful transition uh, to uh, democracy when the people of first Tunisia, then Egypt, Libya, Syria, and elsewhere started to change. But I would say here this morning, if we were sometimes too optimistic then, it's easy to become too pessimistic now and conclude the opposite, that there's no alternative to the repressive regimes that we saw then. And I think just as no one at that time should have simply thought that five years later, five years after Presidents Ben Ali, Mubarak, and Saleh, and Colonel Gaddafi left power, that somehow we would see uh, that the alternative to that uh, would be a return to the kinds of repressive regimes that led to those revolutions uh, in the first place. So let's not make that overshooting mistake as we interpret the world today. What's clear from the American point of view, at least or from the administration's point of view, is that the United States has a clear interest in supporting these democratic transitions. 
Uh, as President Obama said at West Point just last uh, month, uh, America's support for democracy and human rights is not just a result of our values, but a matter of U.S. national security. Respect for basic human rights is an antidote to the instability and grievances that fuel violence and terrorism. Given the imperative of this work, we in the White House and throughout the administration ask ourselves constantly, uh, how can the United States support the aspirations of the people in the Middle East and North Africa uh, who are demanding this change? How can the United States work with its international partners uh, to support the democratic transitions in places that have not before had peaceful transfers of power? We know it's not easy, but uh, we also know the interest we have in the right outcome, and that's why we're constantly asking these questions, and, that, and that's why forums and discussions like uh, this one are so important uh, because we need to learn from our experiences and we need to learn from our uh, mistakes to try to get this right. Uh, our approach has consisted of avoiding trying to pick uh, winners or parties among the different groups uh, throughout the Middle East, but instead to focus on support for the underlying principles of democracy, knowing that the return to an authoritarian regime will never be the answer. We seek to support the people of these countries in their transitions to democracy, no matter how long it will take. We know it's not a short-term problem. We know it's not on the horizon of this administration. We're not asking ourselves how we can finish this in two and a half years. We're asking how we can set the bases over the long term, because it's in the interest of the United States, and it's in uh, the interest of the people of the region. Let me just mention a couple of uh, examples touching on some of the countries represented here and on the agenda today. Starting with Tunisia, uh, where the recent wave of transition started, uh, we welcomed on January 27th of this year the signing of a new constitution uh, which respects the rule of law, freedom of beliefs, and equality for all citizens. Uh, I was proud to join Secretary Kerry in his uh, visit to Tunis last February, uh, where he went specifically to show our support for the Tunisian transition. Uh, and I was also pleased to be able to join President Obama uh, in welcoming Prime Minister Jermaine to the Oval Office uh, in April. Uh, on June 3rd, the United States and Tunisia signed a $500 million loan guarantee fulfilling a pledge that President Obama made during the Prime Minister's visit to the United States, following our 2012 loan guarantee of $485 million, which facilitated Tunisian access to global capital markets for the first time since 2007, and is part of our broad economic and security cooperation in support of Tunisia's transition. We know no country can be a specific model for any other, but Tunisia does show the possibilities of compromise and inclusion and how they can lead to positive results. In Egypt over the past several years, there has frankly been all too little compromise and inclusion. President Obama has delivered the same message to each of the last few Egyptian leaders. Govern in the interests of all Egyptians, or you will fail. We want you to have stability and prosperity, but this will only come if you protect the rights of your people and invite your opponents to participate in deciding the country's future. Unfortunately, uh, President Mubarak, the SCAF, and President Morsi all ignored this advice to their own detriment and that of their country. And over the last year, we've continued to encourage the interim government to govern inclusively and respect the Egyptian people's rights to basic freedoms like expression, assembly, and due process and rights. Obviously, these are choices for the Egyptians to make. It's not for the United States to dictate anything to any country. But it is the advice of a close friend uh, who doesn't believe that you can successfully bring stability in Egypt while uh, excluding large segments uh, of the population. So we're committed to our strategic partnership with the people of Egypt, and we want to see Egypt succeed. Uh, at the same time, we are honest about the threats posed by disenfranchising, disenfranchising large segments of the population. Uh, when the government used large-scale violence against civilians and detained opposition leaders uh, uh, last year, President Obama made clear that he couldn't conduct business as usual. So we withheld the delivery of some major weapon systems, pending progress towards democratic reforms and inclusive governance. While we recognize the outcome of the presidential election and look forward to working with President al-Sisi, we continue to point out that democracy is not just about elections. As we said in our press statement on the election, true democracy is built on a foundation of rule of law, civil liberties, and open political discourse. 
We're now urging a new president to take an inclusive approach to reconciling the Egyptian people's demands for dignity, justice, participation in the political process, and political and economic opportunity. Our support for mutual security interests has not ceased, but this should not be viewed as carte blanche to the current government. We will continue to support the political, social, and economic aspirations of the Egyptian people. In 2011, the Libyan people, with great courage and against all expectations, demanded change after four decades of oppression on the Gaddafi. Working with the United Nations, the Arab League, and our other international partners, the United States drew on a range of diplomatic and military tools to protect the Libyan people from Gaddafi's brutality, including sanctions, international isolation, and a NATO-led military operation. This support prevented Gaddafi from fulfilling his own too credible threat to kill thousands of innocent people. Less than one year after Gaddafi's ouster, the Interim Transitional National Council peacefully transferred power to an elected General National Congress. That moment was one of, one of justified relation in Libya. But we also knew that it was only one step in a very difficult process as political divisiveness, well-armed militias, and weak institutions threatened to derail the hopes and aspirations of the Libyan people. And just as we stood by the Libyan people during their uprising, we continue to stand with them now working with our international partners to build effective national security services, loyal to the democratically elected government, to improve the capacity of the national and local government to meet the needs of the Libyan people. And we continue to provide technical assistance in support of the foundations of a democratic system, civil society, free media, and independent institutions. Recognizing the danger posed by increased political polarization, we're working closely with the United Nations key international partners on a mediation effort to help Libyans come to a political agreement about the next steps in their democratic transitions, underscoring the need for reconciliation to avoid violence and achieve aspirations of the Libyan people who sacrificed so much in their uprising against the Gaddafi dictatorship. Uh, these are just a few of the examples of the kinds of support the United States is committed to providing during the transitions throughout the region. Uh, obviously, there are other cases and uh, uh, we can perhaps discuss those uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, Syria is obviously critical, Iraq, given the developments of the last week. But I think these cases that I mentioned give you a sense of what our uh, goals are and the types of tools we are trying to use to bring about a difficult but successful transition. Uh, we know uh, we're more effective when we do this, not just alone, but with our international partners, leveraging international contributions towards these goals. This is another thing in the President's West Point uh, speech. We have close diplomatic cooperation with key partners to convey consistent messages, promote the rule of law, and strengthen the protection of human rights. We also know that the path to stability is through a transparent and inclusive political process where people of all backgrounds, if they renounce violence and agree to the rules of the game, should be fully included, represented, and respected. Terrorists and those seeking to derail democratic transitions should be identified and judged by their actions. We don't for a minute underestimate the threats posed by violent extremists to both the democratic transition and the security of the region. Uh, this again has been all too apparent in Iraq uh, over the past several days and has uh, the attention of the highest levels of our government. As these old regimes have broken down, there have been opportunities for terrorist networks to grow presenting real threats to the security of both the regime and the world. And this is why the President called on Congress to support a new counterterrorism partnership fund of up to $5 million, allowing us, we hope, to work with the countries in the region to build partnerships and capabilities to counter these growing terrorist threats. We'll continue to engage to encourage broad participation in the democratic process by those committed to respecting the rule of law and the peaceful resolution. Of disputes. Conclusion. In an obviously, it is obviously uh, a turbulent, even tragic time throughout the Middle East and North Africa. But it's also an inspiring one. Uh, a time when people's choices and decisions determine the trajectory of their nation's future. The United States has been working on our own democratic transition for over two centuries, and we will uh, we're still finding ways to uh, improve. I said, nobody is a model for anyone else who would necessarily encourage everybody to follow the American political model. Uh, these transitions are hard, 
uh, and I am glad that so many people in this room uh, are working in support of these countries through your research and advocacy and political participation and journalism. Uh, we know in the administration we don't have all the answers. And we're constantly, as I said, asking ourselves how we can do more and how we can do better. Uh, and it's for that reason that we welcome the work that you all do here in this organization, in this room, and look forward to contributions from discussions like those that are planned for today. Thank you very much. Philip Gordon, who I should have said at the beginning, is the special coordinator for the Middle East North Africa at the White House. It's in your program as well. Uh, is, has agreed to take a few um, uh, questions. Uh, please, uh, I also mentioned that we are live streaming, uh, and I know a lot of my friends are watching uh, there, so know that your questions are being live streamed all, all over the place. Please identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, first question right here. We have a, a volunteer for the microphone. Please. Uh, there's a microphone over there. If a microphone doesn't come to you, please uh, go to the microphones. Abdi Mokud, the Algerian member of the Egyptian parliament that was elected right after the Egyptian Revolution, a member of the Freedom and Justice Party. Uh, I thank you for the statements you made about the importance of supporting uh, democracy, rule of law, and human rights in Egypt. I do share the uh, caution, optimism you have. Uh, I think we uh, would like to uh, emphasize the following. Number one, Mr. Sisi, uh, has killed so many Egyptians, uh, is putting the country now under a state of fear. There is a police state being prepared. There is no freedom of movement. There is no freedom of the service. Journalists are killed, are, as, are in prison. Uh, people, more than 1,000 were sentenced to death in less than five hours. So if this is, I don't think this is what, uh, if this is the issue that America wants. I think it is very important for the United States administration to uh, uh, engage the political forces in the country uh, from all sides so that there is a political solution, not a military solution. Thank you. Can we take them all? Sure. I see a long line. Yeah, let's take all of the questions and then uh, that'll be it. Those next four questions, Barbara. Sure. Barbara Slaven from the Atlantic Council and from monitor.com. Uh, you raised Iraq briefly, but let's ask the Iraq question. Um, What's going on now in terms of the takeover of Mosul? Is this just ISIS or are Ba'athists involved? Do we have a sense of, of how organized this is and whether their goal is to, in fact, enter Baghdad? What are we doing about it in terms of Russian aid? Do we now have leverage to push Maliki to either step aside or accept re a real inclusive government, which he has yet to, to do? And uh, is there any possibility for US uh, action on drone strikes? Thank you. We will consider that one question. Yes. Yes. The former journalist comes out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Safi Hamid. I'm the president of the Center for Egyptian American Relations. Uh, it is an advocacy group uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have two questions. Or actually, I have two questions. The first, um, how much weight does the U.S. government put on what uh, Egyptian Americans, who are more than half a million, I think, because the majority of them actually uh, condemns what uh, uh, the uh, what's happening in Egypt in terms of military coup and silence from uh, the side of the Arab administration. Uh, we interpret this silence as uh, actually condoning. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Wrong. And uh, the other thing also uh, related to Tunisia uh, um, is related to uh, who puts the policy really, who calls the shots. We hear all kinds of rumors about that uh, the administration has to do the Department of Defense. And uh, if uh, this is true, uh, we are very concerned because I think uh, Egypt is not only uh, good for uh, military interests. Uh, this would be a, something which would backfire in our uh, views as American citizens. Thank you. Before last question. Uh, Dina Potter, uh, associate professor uh, from the University of Maryland. Um, basically, the Apache helicopters um, 
Could you keep your uh, microphone microphone close to you? The the um uh, giving away the party for offers and giving uh, starting uh, trickling down the six hundred uh, fifty million uh, dollars to Egypt um, has been commented on by Professor Haidel Fogg. I'd like to quote something and get your reaction from an op-ed that he published. Chuck Cagle and John Kerry have been sending powerful diplomatic signals underscoring our special relationship with CCM faculty. Both are trained and minted in the U.S. and as Paris recent appearances have definitely demonstrated, both are regarded as America's faithful holders who understand the terms of a special relationship between the two companies. The special relationship that faculty and CCM understand so well is straightforward enough. When it comes to human rights violations committed against the faceless and blurred pair of masses, Washington cares only about two things, Israel and India, in that world. And this will be the last question. My name is Sayyid Ali Basha, a professional doctor, but I'm the interested in foreign affairs. So my simple, my simple question to you, sir, is why the United States of America has double standard? Uh, I'll quote you two examples. And, uh, for instance, in 1992, the IS was one direction in, in going to one direction in Nigeria, it was clash. Then Hamas one direction, they said we don't talk to you because the terrorist organization, because our ally and they will be terrorist organization. Now Mursi was elected and by the people and he was thrown out by a military young man. And uh, so far as the people say that all the these the, the Intelligence agencies of the MI6 or CIA or something, they're all behind this ruthless uh, dictators. And now, uh, for instance, Iran wants to have some nuclear uh, energy source and they want to sanctions, but Israel is occupying the Palestinian lands one after another and there are no sanctions on Israel. Why is it a Thank you very much. All easy questions. No, <laughs> I can see you're set up today for a day of very vigorous uh, debate, which is a good thing, because as I said, uh, when I got up here, we don't pretend to have uh, easy answers to very difficult uh, questions. Let me actually group them, because in a way, uh, most of them were about Egypt, and one was about Iraq, and I'll, I'll do it in reverse uh, order. Obviously, Barbara, uh, like I said, we take what's happening in Iraq uh, very seriously. It's a, a dramatic set of developments on top of what's already taking place in Syria and underscores the nature of uh, the linkages between those two things. As we know that Israel travels back and forth between the two countries and indeed sees it as a common theater. I won't try to assess here what their ultimate uh, ambitions are. Uh, I suspect they are pretty broad uh, and if they could move on beyond uh, what they've currently done, they would. And that's why it is our uh, job and determination and interest to stop them from doing so. Uh, we have been over some time and we'll be accelerating our support to the uh, government in Baghdad. We've accelerated uh, military deliveries because they need the capacity to fight these terrorist groups. Uh, we have accelerated our training uh, and we are uh, looking at all options to uh, make sure that ISIS's advance uh, doesn't move forward. Uh, but we've also, and this is a key part of it, uh, emphasized the importance in Iraq, just as I emphasized it regarding these other countries, of political inclusion. So it's not just about fighting and stopping the terrorists militarily, which it is and which needs to be done, but it's also about building Iraq for all Iraqis so that they feel uh, part of the same country, and then that, that implies uh, reaching out to adversaries. And so just as we are pressing very hard to support the government uh, with the means it needs to fight the terrorists, we are equally pressing not just the government, but other political entities in Iraq uh, to come together and isolate the extremists. And you need both of those pillars uh, if, you're, uh, if you're going to succeed. Uh, I can group a lot of the questions on Egypt because they all touched on uh, similar themes, some of which I emphasized uh, in my own remarks. And I was clear uh, that we don't choose among individuals and party or parties uh, in any of these countries, and that gets to the question about uh, double standards. 
uh, uh, its principles that uh, we support. One of the principles we support uh, in Egypt is the need uh, to have an inclusive, sustainable democracy. To be clear, we have an interest, a strategic partnership with Egypt, and we need it to go on. We have many common uh, interests, including fighting terrorism, stability in Egypt, uh, the peace treaty with Israel, uh, the prosperity uh, of the Egyptian people, uh, and Egypt's economy. And we've been very clear that that strategic partner should go on, and we want Egypt to succeed, and uh, we're not looking to turn back uh, the clock. The President made clear uh, that notwithstanding the developments over the past, not just year, but several years, uh, he looks forward to working with uh, uh, President Al-Sisi and helping to support uh, Egypt. At the same time, as I also said, uh, he has been clear that we don't believe Egypt can succeed unless there is more inclusiveness and outreach towards uh, the opposition that there, that there has been. Uh, and once again, while it's not for us to decide uh, what the future of Egypt politics should look like, uh, as a friend of Egypt, we ask the question how there can be stability if all too many people in the political process feel uh, excluded. And that's the challenge that uh, the Egyptians are going to have to sort through. And we have, like I also said, uh, uh, suspended some delivery of major military systems to indicate that, uh, that it is not business as usual. Uh, until the government moves in that direction, it's going to be difficult for the United States to support it and, and help it to, see, to succeed like we would like to. One of the questions was specifically about the voice of Egyptian Americans, and I want to say we obviously welcome the voices of Egyptian Americans. One of the best things about our democracy is everybody gets to contribute to it. Uh, the voice of Egyptian Americans uh, is critically important, and we listen to it. Uh, carefully. I don't think, sir, to, to be fair, that it's accurate to talk about silence of the U.S. government when it comes to Egypt. We've been quite clear about all of the principles that I just uh, articulated at the time, directly with Egypt's leaders, and by me uh, here this morning. Uh, and to answer your other specific question, the President calls the shots based on the principles that I articulated. Uh, an interest in a stable Egypt, an interest in a partnership with Egypt, uh, but also in a long-term, sustainable, inclusive, and non-violent uh, democracy in Egypt. Uh, we can't do it for the Egyptians. We can only stand by and help uh, his friends. Uh, look, I would love to carry on and spend the day, because like I said, these questions indicate a big, vigorous day of uh, debate and discussion ahead. But uh, we end where I began, which is thanking you both for having me here and the opportunity to speak to this group. Uh, but also for the work uh, that you're doing towards our common interests in promoting democracy throughout the world. Thank you very much.